In her own bedroom, a woman was discovered dead. Her two sons, who shared the same home, saw and heard nothing. Detectives began their investigation, but they were unable to identify the offender. No one was ready for the truth that came to light, even though it took 38 years for the case to make progress. Linda Slayton was born in 1950 in Alabama, United States. She was raised by devoted parents and had a younger sister named Judy. Linda was kind-hearted and ambitious from a young age. She made a lot of friends by constantly attempting to assist others. She later wed Frank, and the two of them had two sons, Jeff and Tim. But as time passed, their marriage grew more and more troubled. Frank began abusing his wife and kids after becoming addicted to alcohol. Linda ultimately made the decision to relocate to Florida with her sons. They made their home in Lakeland, where Linda's sister and parents were already residing. Setting aside all of her time to support her sons, Linda rented a home in a lakeside community. Linda worked at a number of jobs, but she was never wealthy. She occasionally had to sell her possessions in order to pay her bills. Because she could not even afford a car, Jeff, her older son, had to commute by bicycle. Tim, her younger son, was a football player and frequently had to ask his coach for a lift home from practice in order to avoid having to walk. Linda made it her mission to spend as much time and energy as possible with her sons, even in the face of financial hardship. She tried to make sure their childhood was full of happy memories by taking them on walks, taking them to concerts of their favorite bands, and so on. When Linda was 31 years old, on September 3, 1981, in the evening, she waited for Tim to get done with his practice before accompanying him to the neighbor's small family celebration. When Jeff got home, he wanted to have dinner, but the refrigerator was empty. After becoming enraged with his mother, he rode his bicycle to his grandparents' residence on the opposite side of town. After the entire family got home, Jeff got into a fight with his mother about the empty refrigerator, but in the end, they said goodnight to one another and went to bed. The next morning, Linda received a visit from her sister, who also lived in the same complex inviting her over for coffee. When she knocked on the door, nobody answered. Thinking Linda had gone somewhere, the woman turned around to leave when she noticed the bedroom window was open. When she went to look inside, she saw Linda lying on the other side of the bed. The woman screamed and ran to the neighbors to report what she had seen immediately. She only needed to take one glance at her sister's face to know that she was dead. When detectives got to their home, they started looking over the scene of the crime. With a wire hanger around her neck and her clothes half down, Linda lay on her bed. Based on the evidence, the police surmised that the victim had been attacked and strangled by an unidentified man who had entered her room. Soon after, forensic specialists discovered a palm print on the windowsill, supporting this theory. Since the apartment lacked air conditioning, Linda frequently left it open which allowed the murderer easy access. The victim's oldest son woke up from all the noise while the detectives were at the crime scene. After escorting him outside, the detectives broke the devastating news of his mother's passing. They woke up his younger brother later and escorted him out. But as the boy was passing by his mother's room, a second policeman came out, and Tim saw his mother's body through the open door. He instantly froze and the officer had to pull him away. Tim, who was 12, and Jeff, who was 15, were completely shocked. At first, they were unable to accept their mother's death. When the investigators were able to speak with the brother later, he said they had not heard anything or even woken up that night. The detectives thought this was odd, even though they had their own rooms. Given the brutality of the murder and the excellent acoustics of the building, Loud noises ought to have been audible from the victim's room. The neighbors were questioned by the police, but they had also heard nothing. That day, none of the complex's occupants had seen any suspicious people. After examining the victim's body, medical professionals concluded that she had been abused. Although they were able to remove the murderer's biological material, DNA analysis was not yet possible. The experts verified that Linda's death was due to strangulation. Therefore, 
the investigators were left with very little evidence to work with. They could only benefit from the palm print if they could locate a suspect and compare them. Linda's sons went to live with their grandparents. They continued to live in shock and continual fear of being pursued by the unidentified killer. Because of the extreme fear, their grandfather sat with a rifle in the living room while they slept in the same room as their grandmother. The investigators thought the kids were not in danger, though. They believed that the killer had to have known the victim and that the crime was motivated only by sexual desire. Following their conversation with Linda's family, they discovered that her ex-husband had a violent past. He was the top suspect right away, but the police soon discovered that the man was not there when the murder happened. Investigators later learned that Linda had begun dating a particular man not long before she passed away. They were able to track him down, but he also had a strong alibi. The fingerprints of all the victim's neighbors were compared by the detectives with the sample found on the windowsill. They then tried the same procedure on all the men who had previously been found guilty living in Lakeland, but they were unable to find any matches. After Linda's sons began to heal over several weeks following the murder, their family finally concluded that sending them back to school would be the best course of action. It did eventually assist the brothers, as they started talking to friends once more and eventually resumed a regular life. Tim returned to the football team because his mother had always been pleased with his achievements. He put a picture of his team in his bedroom a month after she passed away as a memento of how his mother had inspired him to pursue his dreams. In the meantime, the detectives were unable to identify a viable suspect and came to a standstill. They made the decision to start over and reevaluate why the sons had not heard any screams or indications of a struggle. After going over Jeff's statements, the police discovered that on the day Linda was killed, he got into a fight with her. The teenager himself added that he and his mother had verbal arguments on a regular basis. This led the investigators to wonder if Jeff had murdered his mother. They summoned him in for questioning and once more posed a variety of queries. Jeff quickly learned that he was under suspicion from the investigators for the crime. The detectives persisted in their pressure even after he denied any involvement. Jeff accepted their offer to take a polygraph exam. Although the polygraph operator did not find any evidence of deceit, the police were not willing to give up. Not too long after, they summoned him back for interrogation and even made arrangements to have him hypnotized. Jeff was under constant pressure, and the investigators even accused him of killing his mother by strangulation. The family of Linda reached a breaking point as a result and they forbade the police from speaking to Jeff and insisted that they concentrate on finding the true murderer. Jeff consented to take another polygraph test in spite of this, and after receiving positive results, he was at last written off as a suspect. After that, the case did not move forward for a long time. Tim and Jeff grew up, gained employment, and began their own families. Their mother's murder continued to haunt them. But each time they reached out to the investigators, they were met with the same response. Nothing had changed in the case. Scientists took a DNA sample from the biological material on the victim's body in March 1999. When a new detective was brought on to the case two years later, he compared it with samples from every suspect, including Linda's two sons, but there were no matches. There were no results even when it was compared to the FBI database. When Jeff first met this detective, he found out that he had known him for a long time. It turned out that the men and their mutual friends went bowling together on a regular basis. When they spoke, the investigator assured Jeff that he would do everything in his power to solve the case. Tim and Jeff learned of another unsolved crime that had been going on for a long time around the same period. Following extensive media coverage, fresh information surfaced that helped apprehend the offender. At that point, the brothers made the decision to talk to reporters about their family's tragedy. They conducted a thorough interview, and the local newspapers published the story. The detective received an intriguing lead in September of 2001. He discovered that a year after Linda's murder, a man by the name of Jimmy Ulmer had kidnapped a young woman through her bedroom window. He was sentenced to 80 years in prison for this crime. 
The fact that this individual resided in the same apartment building as Linda, only a short distance from her home, added to the intrigue at the time of her murder. Since it was non-existent at the time of Ulmer's arrest, criminals' DNA had not yet been added to a shared database. The man himself died in 1996, and no biological samples remained. But when the investigator got in touch with the offender's mother, she gave some personal items from which the specialists were able to remove the sample. Sadly, the results did not match the killer's DNA, but the investigator was not about to give up. He kept in touch with Linda's sons, kept looking for new suspects, and repeatedly asked the FBI to check the killer's DNA sample against every database they could find. Sadly, he had health issues in 2015, which made him retire even though he had promised to see the case through to the end. Jeff and Tim had been so close to accepting that their mother's killer would never be found by then. But when Cease Moore, a well-known genetic genealogy specialist, took up the case in 2019, new hope materialized. She obtained the murderer's DNA sample, uploaded it to open databases, and started looking for matches. Usually, these databases can even assist in locating the DNA owner's most distant relatives, who may reside in different regions of the globe and be completely unaware of one another. By using this information, one can follow their family tree, look for shared ancestors, eliminate thousands of relatives, and determine who the DNA owner is. Moore was able to identify one family that was residing in the area at the time of the murder after carrying out all of this intensive investigation. She came to the conclusion that the only member of that family who met all the criteria was the one who was most likely the murderer. He was someone the detectives had come across in previous reports as soon as they heard his name. The man was Tim's football coach, Joseph Clinton Mills, and he would often give him a lift home after practice. Although he had never been on the list of suspects, in 1981 he had given a statement over the phone to the police after dropping Tim off at home that day. The idea that Mills might be the murderer was not even entertained by any of the detectives, since he was only 20 years old and there was no evidence at all against him at the time. The police did not compare his fingerprints and DNA to samples that were discovered at the crime scene. The investigators made the decision to withhold this discovery's disclosure from Jeff and Tim. They had to confirm that Mills was actually responsible for their mother's murder first. After reading his biography, they discovered that Mills was detained in 1984 on suspicion of forging a will. His fingerprints were obtained, and they are still preserved in a paper archive. After comparing them to the victim's windowsill fingerprints, experts discovered a perfect match. They eventually found out who the likely murderer was 38 years later. The detectives proceeded to the last phase as soon as this information was discovered, requesting a DNA sample from Mills so they could compare it with the biological material taken from the victim's body. They found out the man was still residing in the same home as he had in 1981. At this point, Mills was 58 years old, married, had a small business, and children and grandchildren. For several weeks, the detectives kept an eye on him in the hopes of obtaining something that had his DNA. It might have been a bottle, a coffee cup, a cigarette butt, or anything else. But since they were never given the chance, the cops made the covered decision to take his trash. They gave the bag to the lab, where professionals quickly found an object that matched his DNA. The results came back quickly. Mills' DNA exactly matched the sample that was discovered on Linda's body. Following that, the detectives met with Linda's sons to update them on the investigation's status. While they were both taken aback, Tim found it more difficult to accept. He was shocked to learn that his football coach was the same monster that had murdered his mother. In addition to the fact that Tim looked up to and respected him, Mills still gave him rides home from practice after the murder. The man gave him unceasing encouragement and inquired about any updates regarding his mother's case. For a long time, Tim's old bedroom featured a picture of his football team, with the monster that killed his mother standing right behind them. When Mills was arrested that same year, he handled himself calmly and did not even inquire as to the nature of his charges. 
Upon being interrogated and questioned about Linda's murder, he denied any involvement. He said he dropped him off and headed out. Mills claimed he had never been inside their home, but the investigators knew this was untrue. The suspect abruptly altered his account of what happened after they told him about the DNA and fingerprint match. According to Mills, Linda asked him to sneak into her bedroom through the window that evening for a private conversation. She then requested that he give her a light hanger choke, but Mills misjudged his strength and killed her. The investigators, understandably, were skeptical of this account at first. In light of all the available data, their theory was far more likely to be correct. Mills had seen Tim's mother on multiple occasions and could have targeted her as a victim. He dropped the boy off on the night of the murder, and the boy went straight to a neighbor's house with his mother for a party. Mills drove a distance away from their house, taking advantage of the fact that no one would be home, and then he returned on foot, breaking through Linda's bedroom window and hiding in the closet. He waited for everyone to go to sleep for several hours. He took a wire hanger out of that same closet and used it as a murder weapon. He violently attacked the victim before exiting the house through the window. Mills was charged with the murder and the case was sent to court based on all the evidence that was available. For this kind of offense, Mills could have received the death penalty in the state of Florida. However, on February 9, 2022, he made the decision to reach a settlement with the prosecution in order to avoid this outcome. He admitted to the murder, but he was exempt from sharing the specifics of the crime under the terms of the agreement. This fact did not sit well with Linda's sons. Tim yelled at his coach in the courtroom, demanding to know why he had taken his mother away from him, but the man just stared down and said nothing. When given the chance to make a closing statement, Mills only said, I am a good person, I am not who they are trying to portray me as. Even though this infuriated the brothers even more, in the end, they were appreciative of the investigators for solving the case and identifying the murderer. Mills received a life sentence without the chance of release. Following the verdict's announcement, Jeff and Tim pledged to live moral lives and devote themselves to their families because they knew their mother would have approved of it. At Israel's southernmost point on the Red Sea sits the resort city of Eilat. It is renowned for having warm weather, crystal clear waters, and lovely beaches. Since the streets are rarely completely empty at night and Elliot's crime rate is still relatively low, residents feel safe walking around the city. However, this was not the case in the early 2000s when a mother lost her daughter to this posh town. Following her military service in Ashdod, Israel, on June 14, 2003, 21-year-old Margarita Levy moved to Eilat in the southern region of the country. Margarita relocated to the southern city with the intention of working as a waitress and saving enough money to enroll in Hebrew University of Jerusalem and pursue a nursing degree. Only a few days after arriving in Eilat, on June 18th of that year, Margarita's mother, Olga Levy, contacted the Eilat authorities to report that she had not been able to contact her daughter for a few hours and was concerned that something was wrong. On Wednesday, June 18, 2003, Olga reported to the police that she had received a call from Margarita. Aware that Margarita would be living alone, Olga, who was already under a lot of stress from her job, expressed her worries. Margarita reassured her that everything was well and attempted to calm her down. Margarita informed her mother she was heading to the beach to unwind before hanging up. The question of which beach Margarita was heading to was overlooked by Olga, who was preoccupied with work. That was their final exchange of words. When Olga got home from work in the evening, she tried to call Margarita again, but her phone was off. Olga called her daughter repeatedly over the course of the following few hours, but she was unable to get through. Olga's statement prompted the Eilat Police Department to begin looking for Margarita. On June 19, 2003, the following day, in the Yadalam neighborhood of the city, a young woman's body was discovered in a park by a passerby. The woman was face down on her stomach, barely clothed, 
and her body was in an appalling condition. After learning of the horrifying discovery, the police went to the park to look into the young woman's corpse. A towel was draped over her head, and it was layered with blankets. She had suffered severe injuries. She had a stab wound in her chest in addition to wounds to her head, face, and upper limbs. The body was later identified as Margarita's later that day. To investigate Margarita's murder, the Eilat police formed a special investigation team. However, the investigators initially struggled to determine the true circumstances of the murder. In an effort to gather information that might help solve the murder, the police asked the public for assistance as they were having trouble finding a lead in the case. Things began to improve after two weeks, and they eventually had a lead. They asked a man named Sergei Agronov, who was acquainted with Margarita, to come speak with them. After being released from military service in Migdal Hammock, Sergei worked as a salesperson in an Eilat pizzeria. Although he denied killing Margaritas, Sergei admitted to the police that he knew her. Following his testimony, he was taken into custody and questioned under duress. Even after the police searched his house, they found nothing that would have connected Sergei to Margarita's death. The public defender's office represented Sergei in a formal court proceeding concerning his involvement in Margarita's case. The lawyer maintained that although Sergei was acquainted with Margarita, he had a solid alibi that proved he was in his apartment with his roommates during the hours leading up to the murder. In court, the police disputed the assertions made by Sergi's lawyer, claiming that Margarita's body had not been discovered at the murder scene. They suspected that she had been killed somewhere else, and that the murderer had taken her body and moved it to the park. Living close to the park, where it would have been easy for someone to dispose of the body if they were staying nearby, was what initially raised suspicions about Sergei. Sergei's detention was extended. The judge reasoned that there was a reasonable doubt linking him to Margarita's murder. Nevertheless, Sergei was freed from custody after just two weeks because the investigators were unable to locate any additional evidence to support their charges against him. Now that Sergei was free, there were no leads for the detectives to pursue, and the case finally fell apart and became unsolved. The murder case was never closed, even after a long period of time. Devoted to identifying Margarita's killer, the investigators never gave up. They repeatedly tried to get a DNA profile from the items they discovered at the crime scene next to Margarita's body. A gag order on the murder investigation was imposed by the magistrate's court in Eilat on May 18, 2023, marking a significant turn in the case. This prohibited the individuals handling the case from providing any public information about it. The production of DNA evidence has advanced significantly technologically over the years, and investigators from the Israel Police National Headquarters Forensic Identification Laboratory have kept up with this development by continuously reviewing evidence and findings gathered during unsolved case investigations. Following several months, the forensic team was able to create a DNA profile that pointed them in the direction of a possible suspect after re-examining the evidence in Margarita's case. The man who was identified as the suspect was 51-year-old Jaffa resident Sami Abu al -Asl. Sami Abu was a 31-year-old father of five children in 2003. At the time of Margarita's murder, he resided in Eilat and worked in a bar in the city's tourist district. The Eilat District Police maintained the investigation's secrecy despite the finding and the noteworthy development. In order to obtain conclusive evidence of Sani Abu's role in Margarita's murder, the detectives started gathering evidence against him. During a 10-month undercover investigation, the police discovered that Sami Abu had attacked another woman in Eilat in July 2003 approximately a month and a half after Margarita Levy's murder. For this offense, he was apprehended and found guilty. As a result of Sami Abu's 13-year prison sentence for this offense, his DNA was added to the database. Sami Abu's DNA was compared to the sample discovered on Margarita Levy's body using the DNA database, and the investigators discovered that the two samples entirely matched. On May 14, 2023, 51-year-old Sami Abu al-Essel 
was taken into custody after the charges against him were ultimately verified by the evidence. Premeditated murder, aggravated murder, and sodomy were the charges brought against him. After kidnapping Margarita, Sami Abu took her to a remote location and attacked her. He struck Margarita in the face, head, and upper limbs later on, and attempted to strangle her. Sani Abu gave Margarita a chest stab to make sure she was dead. Margarita's body was then covered in blankets and her head also wrapped in a towel. Sani Abu then fastened electrical cables around the blankets. After tying the cables so that they would force the blankets tighter around her body, he threw her corpse into the middle of a nearby park and ran away. Sergei Agronov The initial suspect in Margarita's case was once more placed under arrest for approximately two weeks in order for the authorities to investigate any possible relationship between him and Sami Abu al Asil. Sergi was fully exonerated of any suspicion after it was determined that there was no connection between the two and that Sami Abu committed the heinous act alone. The investigation's latest development was shared with Margarita's family. Margarita's mother, Olga Levy, expressed her thoughts regarding the progress made in her daughter's case. She reported being overcome with emotion upon learning that Margarita's killer had been apprehended. She was now at peace because the monster that killed her daughter was finally going to pay for his crimes, but Olga expressed uncertainty about whether she would want to watch the entire trial. It was a mixed feeling. The sights and sounds of the day Margarita was killed would resurface just by gazing at Samiabu. Olga was attempting to move on from her past traumas and was not interested in going through them again. For 20 years, from 2003 to the present, Olga expressed her gratitude to the Eilat Police Department for their commitment and diligence. All she could hope for now was that Sam Abu would receive the proper penalty for his transgressions. 22-year-old Kyle Klink Scales lived in LaGrange, Georgia, in 1976. The sports-obsessed young man was attending Auburn University in Alabama. At the university, he was beginning to search for his place in the world and mapping out what career to pursue. On January 27, 1976, Kyle left his part-time job at a bar in LaGrange and headed out for the roughly 45 minutes drive to Auburn University, where he was a sophomore. Kyle never made it to the university. When his parents could not get in contact with him, he was reported missing. Nothing out of the ordinary was found at Kyle's apartment to suggest that he ran away or had moved elsewhere. Investigators believed that something happened at some point on his trip. They just did not know what it could be. The Troop County Sheriff's Office and Kyle's parents intensively searched for him in those initial weeks after he went missing. Lakes were drained, rewards were promised, deputies searched woodlands for a single clue. For Kyle's parents, John and Louise Clink Scales, the effort was a passionate, all-consuming quest, mirroring scores of other missing person cases across the country. With loved ones pleading for tips, searchers growing weary with each unsuccessful venture, and members of an exhausted community looking on a gasp, that something so haunting could have happened to one of their own, the determination was the source of admiration for many. Kyle Klinkscales had always liked New Orleans, so his parents bought ads in the city, asking for help to find their son. He loved Hawaii when he visited on some vacation as a boy. So his parents sent letters to every police department in the state, and when tips came in that a person had been found matching his description, strong jaw, shaggy brown hair, thick eyebrows, they drove to the places where those tips originated. Two years after their son's disappearance, the Clink Scales had distributed nearly 5,000 bumper stickers, seeking information. They became supporters for families of others who had missing relatives and tried to call attention to cases not as well publicized. The Clink Scales were among those invited to the White House in 1985 to meet with President Ronald Reagan about ways to address the issue of missing and exploited children in their home, the same one where Kyle Klink Scales had been raised and that was decorated with pictures of him. His parents' drive to find their son would sometimes give way to fatigue. 
In an interview in 1978, John Klinkscales expressed unease. He said maybe his son, who did not really like college, had felt like he was a financial burden on his parents. Instead of dropping out or sharing his feelings, he might just have wanted to make it easier on us by disappearing, John said. Every time Louise and John Klinkscales left their home in LaGrange, Georgia to search for him, one of them would leave behind a note if their son returned while they were gone. They wanted him to know that a lot had changed since he was last seen in 1976. They loved him, the clink scales would write, and there on the dining room table was a spare car key for him. Both John and Louise clink scales submitted their DNA samples to investigators for testing, in case their son's remains were ever found. Sadly, John clink scales passed away in 2007. Louise passed away in January 2021 at the age of 92. A driver in Casita, Alabama, about 30 miles southwest of LaGrange, was on a two-lane road on December 7, 2021, when he saw the hatchback of a rusted vehicle sticking out of the creek and called the authorities. It was a 1974 Ford Pinto poking out from the creek. There were human remains inside the rusty car and about 50 skeletal fragments encased in the mud. It was not clear what allowed the car to become visible from the road after all this time. In February 2023, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation confirmed that the remains belonged to Kyle Clink Scales. The creek where the car was found in Chambers County, Alabama, outside of LaGrange, was never searched because the road would not likely have been Kyle's main route to Auburn, though it might have been an alternate one. Erin Hackley the coroner in Truppy County, Georgia, said that it might take investigators months to determine the exact cause, if they can pinpoint one at all, given the age of the remains. Hackley said when she got the call from investigators that the remains had been identified, she called Kyle's aunt, Martha Morrison, who responded with relief and regret that his parents were not alive to hear the news. Martha added, They were very strong Christians. They had faith that things would work out for them, and they never gave up hope. When the remains of Kyle Clink Scales are returned to his relatives, we plan to drive to Shadow Lawn Cemetery in LaGrange. There, in the soft dirt between the graves of his mother and father, he will be buried, nestled in a space set aside years ago.